Hello? Oh, got a gooey eye. Cat eye gooey. I think it's, it's, hey, it's here. I think we're live. I think it's the gathering room. I made it to the gathering room, even though my scarf is sort of bunchy. Ah, hi, nine people. How are you doing? It's good to see you. You're Akumi, you're the first one on today. Woo! Jessica, hey, thank you for asking about the painting last time. Still there? Um, and Christina and Audie and Donna. Hi, gorgeous. Camille and Emily, Elizabeth and Anne Kareen and Laurie. It's so fun to see old friends. The coolest thing, hi Anne, hi Cleo, is that we we weren't necessarily old friends when the gathering room started, right? Like I didn't know all of you so well. Hi David, how you doing? Out there in Phoenix, Dale, hi. Kathleen and Marnie and Karen and Kasia, it's just fabulous. Hello, gorgeous ones. How lovely to see you here. Okay, so I'll start in a minute here. Because if you know anything about me, you know that I believe in science. And also that I am plagued by miracles. <laughs> Not so much plagued, but they happen. I notice them happening now. I want to talk about them because periodically I just have to, but also because they come around, they seem to come around in this cyclical pattern. And um, I have to make it very clear that I believe that they are all completely scientifically verifiable. It's just that no one has verified them yet. So when I say miracle, I do not mean something that is outside the laws of physics. I didn't, people keep jumping on, so I'm, I'm kind of like, oh, I should just slow down here and reintroduce my topic. The topic is miracles. Oh. Yeah, and I don't think there is anything that is outside the scope of uh, science that is the careful observation of the universe and the accurate calculation of trajectories and so forth. I believe that ultimately everything that happens happens within the laws of physics, but the laws of physics are not known to us um, in their entirety. We know more than we used to. We don't know that much. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that we don't know than there is what we do know. So that said, this week I watched a film. Some of you may have seen it. It's called Superhuman. And it won, it won a bunch of um, film awards at like film festivals around the world. It's called Superhuman, and it's about different abilities that people can acquire that we deem miraculous. And I was interested in it because I'm always fascinated by the place where our culture, which is very, it's, it's weird because we have a lot of religion, but we also have this overarching materialist framework that says, you know, nothing is possible that wasn't deemed possible in Newton's physics in like 1927 before we discovered um, quantum physics. And anything that goes beyond that is just sort of considered to be impossible. Or people get, see something that, that are, culture says it's impossible and then they get all excited and think that the person doing it is God. I don't believe that. I just like the edges of the place where our culture doesn't explain everything. So this movie Superhuman, one of the things it talks about, and you will see, I, go, I get the merchandise. This is something called a mindfold and it's just a blindfold that blocks 100% of the light. And you really can't see anything in it at all. And yet, reliably, anyone under the age of 12, if you put these blindfolds on them for a few hours and do certain types of training, which I have not yet been able to ascertain, they start to be able, first they see like patches of light or little sprinkles of light, and then they become able to see without any light getting to their eyes. And children who go through this training 
uh, they can read with their blindfolds on. They can ride bicycles. They run obstacle courses. It's they climb rock walls. It's not. They say it's just like ordinary seeing. And in the movie, they take a, a woman who is mostly blind. She's I think in her sixties, and she went blind in her early thirties. So she can see a bit of things, but she cannot read menus or do any. She has a big blind spot. And sure enough, they put one of these mindfolds on her. And within a few hours of training, she's able to start reading and seeing things, even things that her trainer is holding. And the trainer, I think, is in Russia while she's in the US. So that's one of the things they do on this show. And, and I went and Googled it and I wanted to learn to do it right away. But apparently it's better for children and the blind because once your brain hardwires in that it's getting visual information through your eyes, it doesn't go to these other sources. What the other sources are, we don't know. Some people think that there are actual photoreceptor cells in our skin. There is also, there's, there are two nerves that are below the opti optic nerve that some animals use to detect infrared, and we have those, but we don't use them. They don't know. Anyway, um, but people can do this. And uh, if you have a child under 12, <laughs> and they're interested you might want to see if they can do it i don't know how the training goes i've been like googling things online that have to be simultaneously translated from the german and stuff this is a well-kept secret then they have other things that are more familiar to me like um uh telekinesis or psychokinesis where you can move an object without using your hands they don't know how this works but um those of you who have hung out at my seminars or read some of my books, know that I, I did learn one little parlor trick, which is how to bend spoons and other metal objects as if they're made of soft clay. And you do that through a process of connecting with the consciousness of the spoon until it tells you it wants to bend and that it bends easily. I'm not gonna do it here because I could so easily fake it and it would be, who cares? The point is not that you can bend spoons. The point is that sometimes you can take a spoon that won't bend and then you can feel its consciousness and you can ask it to bend and then it cooperates with you. The, the telekinesis ones, they have different experiments. I, of course, tried to replicate them. This one, this is one of them. Theirs is much fancier with like a perfect vacuum and everything. But I just took a little coil of paper, suspended it in an empty jar, which is not even well cleaned off. And then I put it on a motionless surface, waited for it to stop moving, and then I tried to move it. The lady in the film can move it easily. I couldn't move it at all. And I've been trying, I promise you. And then like an hour before this broadcast, I was just, I was going to go, um, you know, I was picking it up to bring it over here so I could show you guys. And just for larks, I just put my hand up a couple of inches from the glass and darn it, the thing didn't start moving. It started moving and I've never been able to, I have vivid, vivid dreams that I can move things without touching them. So vivid that in the dreams, I wake up and I go get people and I say, I can move things without touching them. And this isn't a dream, is it? It's not. And they're like, no, it absolutely isn't. And I'm like, okay, watch this. And I make things move and they're like, that's very impressive. Then I wake up and it's not true. And for hours, I can't believe that it's not true. Um, there are other things that I have seen in my life. I have been wondering which stories to tell you about my son. Um, there are, are there are lots of little things. I mean, um, one of the things they say in the superhuman movie is that the the resonance they have a I, I believe it's a guy from Harvard, a physics a physicist, saying the resonances of different aspects of the universe, like the planets are harmonious, similar to fractals of the resonances of vibration in our own bodies. I may or may not have told you guys about how um, there is a film, I'm sure I've told you. It's, it, if you go online and you Google sounds of the planets, the Voyager spacecraft, as it went past the planets, took recordings of magnetic emissions and then turns them into sound and all the planets sound slightly different and some of them sound really weird and some of them sound like static and um I, we were playing those at our house and adam went by and he walked by by the room and then did a double take and came back and he said what are those sounds i have those sounds in my body and um and so when they said that on the film i was like oh that's what adam said i wonder how he knew 
And he said it was a message, by the way, from the planets. And we said it was the planets. He said, oh yeah, that's their message. We were like, what? what's the message? And he said that we're safe, which is just, that's Adam for you. And another thing that I have not spoken of much because I can't really get him to replicate it, but I've seen it twice, is that after he had a unit of yoga in high school gym, they taught him some yoga stretches and he just kept it up in his room and um, started making balls of visible light between his hands. I, this was a, it's a thing. You can go online and you find out they do it, but he just did it. And, and several sober adults watched in broad daylight and kind of went, and uh, I asked him, where did you learn to do that? And he said, school. P.E. I said, which P.E. is like yoga. So these things happen, you guys, and it's really fun to experiment with them because it's not the most like deeply emotionally um, moving thing that, you know, like I often talk about uh, issues where the Venn diagram between spirituality and emotionality intersect, right? So it's like, deep and soft and this is more like a physics experiment but here's the thing the venn diagram does cross because when you get in to a state of complete alignment between what you feel in your heart and your emotions what you know with your mind um what you're actually doing in the world so this is what i call a condition of complete integrity where you know what you really know you feel what you really feel, you say what you really mean, at least to yourself, and you do what you really believe is right. In those moments, that's when magical things start to happen, when miracles start to happen. And I've gone at it both ways. Today, when I went to move the piece, of, to try to move the paper in this jar, I happened to have found the place where miracles happen. And I like to compare this to, um, the dew point in the in the atmosphere. So if you live in a humid place, the water is suspended in the air in droplets and it's warm, it's like steam, right? It is steam. So you don't see it, but as the temperature drops, it stops being steam and it starts being liquid water. So you're just standing in the grass and as the temperature cools, water just seems to appear by magic on the grass and the leaves. So the dew point is the place where steam becomes water. And the miracle point is where something that feels magical becomes normal. And there's a, and it's also the place of alignment between knowing what you know, feeling what you feel, saying what you mean and doing what you really believe is right and what you actually want in your heart. So if you can align all those things, be incredibly honest with yourself, without meaning to, you will start to create magical effects. That's why I think Adam does it so much. He's always in alignment with himself. He will not be pushed out of alignment. Um, and that's partly to do with his extra chromosome and it's partly to do with just who he is. Um, but today when I went to, to try to move this, it's moving now because I moved the jar, but before it was moving without my getting near the jar. And the fact is I had stopped trying. I was completely aligned. I was happy to be getting this ready to show you. Like I want to show my friends my fun experiment I've been doing. Hello. But um, so I was in this state of cheerful, relaxed alignment where magic felt normal because I've been thinking about the many, many, many things that have happened to me over the years that just are t would defy statistical odds at such an enormous level, like crazy um, coincidences. I was, I was asking someone, have I told you the Adam and the Fox in England story? This is just sort of a rando story, but this is the life I lead. A few years ago, we were going to South Africa via London and it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee. So London was absolutely packed, um, swarming with tourists. And we were there for a few days and to, to adjust to our jet lag and I was doing some press stuff. So we took Adam out for a walk, Karen and I did. And um, this was before Ro joined us. So we were out there, the three of us tr trudging along and London is incredibly circuitous as you know, if you've been there. 
And at one point, Adam said, this city is confusing. And I said, yeah, it, 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 it confuses everybody, not just you. Then we went to the Tower of London. And once we got in there, we got these little headsets. You got a map and a headset and you turn on this little recording and it walks you through this map of the area while it tells you the historical significance of the different sites you're seeing. It's cool. And so we said to Adam, do you want the little guided tour earphones? And he said, no, 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 this I recognize. We were like, you do? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I've been here before. And I said, when? And he said, 1658, or I don't remember the exact date, but it was definitely the Middle Ages. And then he looked at the Thames, the River Thames, and he said, but the river should be over here. And I went to my little map and sure enough, at a certain, in the, in the 1700s at some point, they built out the land so that it displaced the flow of the Thames so they could get more land to build on. And he was, he had apparently been there before they had done that. And he remembered that. And so I thought, okay, well, he's seen some kind of knight errant sort of medieval jousting thing and he's into it. And I said, so, um, so did you have armor when you lived here or when you came here before? And he said, oh, no. I would never wear armor and we were like why not and he said and he's very hard to understand he said because it yama makassan we're like yama makassan what does that mean but we were really obsessed with getting it out of yama makassan what does it mean and we couldn't he tried to spell it for us and it was c-o-n-r-d-9-7 finally we gave up and then we were talking about something and he said that that's the word that's the word the word he was looking for when he said yama makassam was consciousness. Armor limits my consciousness. We were like, okay. Armor limits his consciousness and he was here in 1658. So I left Karen and Adam on a bench and I went inside this museum and there were, I'm telling you, the place was swarming, swarming with humans. And I hear this big commotion outside the museum and I went back to where Karen and Adam were sitting on the bench. And Karen told me that as they sat there, there was a hedge next to a nearby building and a fox at two in the afternoon in a crowded, you know, very bright sunny day, jumped out of this hedge and ran around for a while. And the ravens were alarming and little girls were screaming. And then the fox ran right up to where Adam was sitting. He sat down and he stared into Adam's face. And all these people around were rah, 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 rah. and then the fox was there for a few seconds and then boom he took off and adam turned to karen and he said i know that fox <laughs> this is my life people and what i find is that adam lives in complete alignment and when you do that weird things start to happen that our physics say uh shouldn't happen but they are real and they are replicable and when you get there the thing that to, to do the miracle, you must be pulled into the place of happiness. That's the due point of magic. Normal, happy, joyful alignment, not stress, not trying, but just alignment with what is. And when you get to that space, bang, stuff starts happening. So I see there are questions coming up and I am now going to read them and answer them. Hi, Donna. So Donna says, in order to access that magic, which I believe is always possible, is a state of joy essential? Can you access that alignment even if you're feeling sad or troubled? Yes, you absolutely can. The one thing that you can't do without is a feeling of peace. If there's no peace in your heart, sorry, I have allergies, which I cannot miraculously cure for some reason. Um, if you're in a state of agitation or grasping, it will not work. If you're in a state of relaxation and peace, you can be deeply, deeply sad. You can be violently angry. You can be even um, afraid of what comes next. But if you can connect with peace, Anita Morjani, who is a woman who basically died of cancer, um, she, when she died, she would, after four years of fighting, she was basically, her body weighed less than 90 pounds. It was basically a skeleton full of tumors the size of lemons. She died uh, or went into her final coma and seemed to die and encountered what seemed to be her deceased father and, and a deceased friend. And they said, 
they explain things about the universe and then they said you have to go back you have a lot more life to live and she was like in what body and they were like that one she said but it's not okay and they said no no you'll be fine now that you know how things work so she went back into her body and where she had been a very fretful anxious tense person she came to completely certain that everything was fine and within three days her tumors were had reduced by half and within nine days she was cancer free so and i've met her and she's one of these people who's just constantly radiantly um miraculous but she's very clear that she experiences sadness fear anger just like all of us she just never loses touch with the context being a place where everything is ultimately benevolent everything's working for you and death is something that you move into and out of just as life is and so you lose that massive anxiety of death that people have and then even in the drama of life with all its emotions if you can connect she said if you can find acceptance of your situation then you can reach peace and from peace you can go to, to gratitude and from gratitude you can go to joy and she said if you need to walk that, you know it's kind of like a, a line of pebbles to show you your way back from there she said everything is being generated that's that's the dew point of magic so if you can't feel good at least accept that you feel bad and in the acceptance is the dew point of magic and that's where miracles really do happen happen um she doesn't usually say this but uh byron katie who is another person she's a person who's just fully awake and she never um, believes her thoughts and so she experiences reality as completely present and benevolent and at first it was hard for her to adjust this state of mind to the world as it was and she does she never says this but one time I read in something she'd written that after a few months after she had gotten into suddenly into this state of awakening the miracles had reduced a little <laughs> and I was like what miracle and she's like well nothing's a miracle everything's a miracle what do you think um so she's not claiming to do any magical tricks but uh, there, a lot of things started happening around her and i've seen things happen around her as well so it's just people who are accepting where they are in the world adam's not a rocket scientist he's kind of the opposite right but he's completely aligned with what is and he never loses his peace if you ask him and this is not just down syndrome if you ask him like how are you feeling he'll say uh, like at dinner every night we talk about the best thing that happened to us during the day and the worst thing it's, this is from um the benedictine monks that it's called the consolation and the desolation the desolation is the worst thing that happened that day the consolation is the best thing that happened that day and it, when we say to adam so what's the worst thing that happened today he's like nothing ever nothing bad ever happens and it's not because he hasn't had pain and suffering and sorrow it's because he never leaves a state of peace no matter and within that his emotions flow but they they aren't his reality so if you can get there you'll be fine ellen says does hoping for a miracle work i'm thinking you need to be in a in a place of peace and not desperate a place of calm and not desperation in order to experience one absolutely one of my favorite things that oprah used to say is the universe will not reward your desperation so most of us try to work miracles from a place of desperation and this is why i'd love it if you'd go watch superhuman and just play with things when you're just having a pretty good day because when you when you need some faith you know when there's a pandemic and a depression and all the things we're facing now that's not a great place to start developing this practiced way of relaxing into a calm space where miracles can happen usually what happens for me is an intense desire followed by complete relaxation so when in my coaching system when we train coaches i don't know if this is in the actual training but it's certainly part of our vernacular we talk about uh intention attention no tension so you think of something that you really want you pay close attention to it and then you drop it completely drop it the way 
I had completely, I have tried to move objects like this for so long and it never happened and today it just did. And I know I just found that space. And, and it's fun to play with these things in order to come back to that state. It's actually a very narrow band of cheerful, relaxed, calm. But once you tune into it, you can sort of go there the way a singer would find the right pitch. So yeah, you do need to be in a place of calm. If you're desperate and you send that out and then you calm yourself, you may well get what you wanted, but it won't come while you're in the state of desperation. I think of that as a way that, you know, the universe will not train you to be desperate. If your dog only got fed when it was in pain, the dog would learn to put itself in pain in order to get fed. If you got fed by the universe when you were desperate, it would be, you would be in a state of constant desperation, needing a miracle to happen, and, and you'd never leave that place. So, you know, we've talked a lot about trauma over the years, you and I, and trauma is a great place to generate desires for a happy, wonderful, peaceful life. But it's when you find a way to be calm in the moment and accepting of what's happened, that's when you start to break through into these miraculous states that can really, they can supersede even the worst uh, things that, that we can experience, I think. So Heidi said, would you say more about the polarization of consciousness and how that's playing out? Oh my. If you look at political analyses of what's going on in the world right now, the polarization of people's attitudes and opinions is worse than it's ever been. And it's causing more disruption than it ever has. It's causing a lot of violence, a lot of argument, a lot of, um, a lot of really disturbing stuff. But here's the thing. The the bandwidth of magic is narrow and around it there is a big swing there there's a polarized swing of forces so we live in a dualistic universe so for every day there's a night for every two there's a fro we live it, all of our cells are in vibration going up and down up and down actually they're going in spirals vortices but it looks up and down to us um, and what that means is that as things get bigger and as forces get more powerful, both sides have to get more powerful. So what we're seeing is the increase of force, for example, just in the attitudes of humans all over the world, the intensity of feeling and attention. Now here's the interesting part. Both the good and the bad are rising, but the bad makes much more noise. The dew point of benevolent miracles is calm. And nobody goes out and has a, a screaming demonstration about, I'm in a state of calm, <laughs> right? So there are a lot of screaming people doing, you know, saying horrible things, but there is, I believe, a greater number, at least equal, but I think much greater, much greater, a greater number of people. Well, it's sort of like the fanatic fringes on both sides. When I studied feminism in the 80s, this is what I found. There were some really hysterical traditionalists and some really hysterical feminists. And in the middle, a huge silent majority of people who were going, you know what, I prefer, I prefer non-judgment. I prefer everybody gets to be heard. I prefer listening. I prefer allowing. And those people were becoming much more powerful as the polarized sides screamed at each other because the screaming itself is so antithetical to creativity. So we want everything in us is moving toward the calm place of magic. And as the polarization increases, the silent majority of calm, of presence, of listening, that's really rising as well. And that's what's going to change the world. And it's so quiet that we don't even know it's rising. And it's very exciting. Uh, Jessica said, my miracles happen instantly, so easily with animals. I'm working on transferring that to productive life circumstances. Can you comment on that transition from fun to helping yourself? Yeah, animals, they're always in that state of presence. So it's really easy to get animals to respond when you reach that zone of energy. And, I go on endlessly about this. We will talk much more about it as the gathering rooms go on because I'm just obsessed with it. There's my picture of Diana with her boar. If you haven't read my book, Diana herself, that's her talking boar because I'm obsessed with animals. 
But when you're with an animal, what's happening is that in order to connect with it, you're reaching the dew point of magic. You're reaching presence and calm because all animals like to live there. All life likes to be there. Heck, spoons like to be there. <laughs> so as you reach that and the animal reacts when you leave your space of calm, if you get grasping, if you try to force a miracle, no. Here's the way to do miracles. You relax them into being. So the way you'd relax with an animal to get it to be calm, you relax with the world and it starts to be calm. You relax with a piece of paper and it starts to move. You relax with a spoon and it will bend over for you. Um, and so as you relax and relax and relax, eventually you hit a place where life has troubled you like a traffic jam or a disagreement with a loved one that you've had many times and you've practiced relaxing miracles into existence. And so you go there and it's not to make light with your hands and it's not to bend a spoon or move a piece of paper or see with a blindfold, but all of those are helpful because they teach you that dew point. And when you're there, everything wants to work with you. And so the traffic jam starts to flow differently and the argument ceases to be an argument and becomes a mutual discovery. It becomes love. The traffic jam becomes love. Everything becomes love. If you bend enough spoons, you realize they're bending out of love. Everything is responding to love because love is the only real thing here. And that's not a miracle. That's the real world. Everything else is an illusion. So thank you for being with me in the illusion today and playing with these things. Go watch Superhuman. Tell me if you can see with a blindfold. Um, or move paper or do all the magical things like bring them to the gathering room and talk to each other about them i guess nobody you can't just, i'm the only person who can show you but you can all write so have fun have a miraculous week and remember to just relax what you want into existence and we can all t get together and talk about it um psychically with our blindfolds on no! see you next week love you and end live video.